Well, I invite you, if you would, to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. You know, I have forgotten and I apologize to all those folks up there in the balcony. I haven't been looking up there, but I won't neglect you today. Uh, and uh, so let's read in Matthew 17, beginning with verse number 24. It says, And when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, Doth thou, doth not your master pay tribute? He said, Yes. Can you imagine Peter only preaching a one word sermon? That is so unlike him. And when he was come into the house, Jesus prevented him. That word means anticipated. Jesus silenced him, saying, What thinkest thou, Simon, of whom do the kings of the earth take custom of tribute, of their own children or of strangers? Peter said unto him, Of strangers. Jesus saith unto him, Then are the children free. Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea, and cast a hook, and take up the fish that first cometh up. And when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money that take and give unto them for me and thee. Let's pray. Our Father, we pray that you'll grant to us the liberty to take a truth from this passage of Scripture and make it plain, and may your Spirit be at work. Begin in my own heart, and I pray that your Spirit will be at work in each heart and life, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're glad to be back this time last Sunday. I was in 80 degree temperatures in Naples, Florida. It's a tough life, but somebody has to do it. And, uh, but we're glad, my wife and I are glad to, to be here today. You know, she pointed something out to me. I knew this as I thought about it. But last year in the ho when I was in the hospital, Susan received a blanket. And uh, she pulled that blanket out this week. Uh, and you know what it said on it? It said, from our friends at First Baptist Church. You sent us a blanket while we were in the hospital, and we certainly appreciated that, and, and thank you for that. I'm uh, glad we we're able to be here. You've been so welcoming and kind, and uh, we thank the Lord for that. Glad my mother's here, and, uh, and so uh, glad I got some friends here. Glad uh, Paul and Patsy Reber are here. Uh, that's Donna's sister and her husband. They're from uh, uh, Illinois. I'm glad my friends the Tikas are here. And the Tikas are from the Philippines. They came all the way from the Philippines just to hear me preach today. And so they need money to get back. If you could help them. We don't want them here long, but make sure you get them back. But uh, they are incredible, as you know, they're incredibly talented people. And uh, uh, they, they, we sponsored them when they came. And I would call them initially. And I never could get them. They would never go to wherever they were staying and get them for me. And you know what I figured out? They were in Florida one time, and I called, and the secretary said, well, they're at the back end of the building. Uh, who should I tell them is calling? I said, tell them their voice teacher is calling. He was at the phone in 30 seconds. <laughs> Boy, now that's a lie, because I'm no longer their voice teacher. I was, but I'm no longer their voice teacher. But I'm glad to see them, and I got other friends here today, and I'm glad you're here. Here's the theme today. Here's how the Lord's working in my heart. As I read this story, here's the thought that came across my mind. And I think the Holy Spirit put it in my heart. Lord, I need a miracle. Do you need a miracle? In some aspect in your life you know as a church 
one of the things we need here at First Baptist is God needs to direct the right man and the right family. And God will do it. And I'm going to give some principles today from this passage that sort of helps us and encourages us in this time of need, whatever the need is in your life, whatever the problem is in your life. You know, when you look at this miracle, one of the things you can see from this miracle is this is perhaps the most unique miracle of provision in all the Bible. And one of the things that, that jumped out at me as I read this chapter is I thought, you know, you know, there is never a dull moment in the life of one who follows the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what Peter, James, and John discovered when they became disciples. Because when you read this entire chapter, when this chapter opens up, you find Peter, James, and John up on top of the mountain, Mount Transfiguration. Most people assume or suggest that it's a mountain called Mount Hermon, which is the highest mountain in that area. And it's next to uh, Caesarea Philippi, which is the region that Jesus was in in the uh, preceding chapter. And so Jesus took Peter, James, and John up on that mountain, and there they were introduced to Elijah and Moses, two guys they had only read about, and these two guys were brought back to life. Somebody says, do you really believe that? Listen, I believe this is God's word. It's not for me to say, is that true or not? It's for me to accept the truth. Listen, if it's not God's word, we might as well go down to the moose. If it's not God's word, this is the last place I want to be on Sunday morning. This is God's word. And Moses and Elijah were there. And Peter and James and John saw it happen. And they saw Jesus in his glorified body. And then they're coming down off the mountain. And they're in the valley. And they encounter a boy who is possessed with demons. And look at verse number 15. Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic. We were with some friends last night, and I told them that my dad used to suggest that this was his lifetime verse. Lord, have mercy upon me. My son is a lunatic. And they couldn't heal him. And then you come to the passage we read today, and here's Peter. He goes down to the river bank. He drops a hook or a line in the water. And God sends the right fish. And he takes the coin out of his mouth. And he goes and pays the tax. There is never a dull moment when you follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to this. Because he plans the experiences of our life. Jesus and his disciples have been out ministering. And now they've come back to the home base. It says in verse 24, which is Capernaum. And you might remember that uh, at Capernaum, that was the birthplace of Peter. Peter had a home there. Peter had a family there. Peter had a wife there. Peter at one time had a fishing business there before he left it all to follow Jesus. And then the tax collector shows up. Now keep in mind, and this is, I think, an important thing when you think about the context of this story. This was not a civil tax. This was not an income tax. This was a religious tax. And this was a tax that was started in the days of Moses when they got ready to build the tabernacle and they instituted this civil tax or this religious tax. And later on, when the temple had to be repaired, they put out a box and asked the people to contribute. And this became actually standard procedure in Israel. And so once a year, every male 
was required to support the temple by giving a half shekel tax. And of course, Peter didn't have any money. And the shortest speech he ever gave is the one I pointed out there in verse 25, where it's just a one word. And that's unlike Peter. Ordinarily, he would have preached a sermon. I mean, this was a guy that was always sticking his foot in his mouth. And the tax collector comes to Peter and he says to Peter, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? What kind of loyal Jewish man is he? And all Peter could think of to say was yes. And you know what? This miracle is a great help to you and me when we face needs and when we face problems and when we face difficulties. Perhaps your problem today is not necessarily the paying of your taxes. Maybe it's finding a job. Maybe as a church is finding a new man and his wife and family to lead you into the future. Maybe it's sickness in your home. Maybe it's the loss of your own health. Maybe it's some burden, some difficulty that is pressing you down. I don't know what it is, but one thing I do know, and one thing I am certain of, is everyone here has some kind of need that they're facing, some kind of difficulty. Every Wednesday afternoon from four to six, I know looking at me, you're not gonna believe this, but every Wednesday afternoon from four to six and every Friday afternoon, I play racquetball. And I play racquetball with a group of guys. We'd go over there to the family fitness and for those two hours we play racquetball. And three weeks ago, one of them contacted us. He's 51. And he said, hey, pray for me. He's the only, one of, he's the only believer I play with. The rest are my mission field. And he said, pray for me. He said, my wife has COVID. One week later, he connected with us and he said, the Lord's taken her. 51 years old. Three kids in their early 20s. A need, a problem. We were with friends last night and one of the ladies shared that her dad just recently discovered that he was full of cancer and it doesn't look good. I stood in the parking lot of a business in this town and talked to a man I have known for over 20 years. The tears just rolled down his face as he shared with me that his wife was just diagnosed with cancer. And it doesn't look good. I was in Florida last week and I preached and a guy I know, he's pastored for, for years. He served as the chaplain of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And God is still using him where he is. And he came with tears rolling down his face said, Donna's not here, that's his wife. He says, I don't know, brother, that if she's going to make it. And maybe you're here today and you have some kind of need. And perhaps someone has said to you, doesn't your master, the one that you say you believe in, doesn't he care enough about you? to take care of your needs. Satan maybe can even be whispering in your ear. See, it really doesn't matter to follow if you follow him. And this particular miracle of provision is a special encouragement 
when we face needs and when we face difficulties and when we face important situations in our life. And from this miracle, I want to share three great assurances or encouragements. And so from this miracle, let's just quietly, quietly pull out three great assurances to help us when the night is dark. To help us when the door is closed. To help us when the trap door is open and we start to fall in. First great assurance. Are you ready for this? It's that Jesus Christ knows your need. Jesus Christ knows your need. The tax collector says to Peter, Does your master Pay the temple tax. And after hearing that, Peter turns to go inside the home where Jesus is. And can't you just imagine what's going on inside Peter? I mean, how in the world are we ever going to pay this tax? I mean, knowing Peter and reading about him in Scripture, the wheels were spinning and he probably thought he was going to have to go in and explain it all to Jesus. Maybe he was going to have to go in and tell Jesus exactly what he should do in this situation. After all, Jesus would definitely need his help. And when Peter walked in, watch this. I hope I can make this clear. When Peter walked in and he began to open his mouth, God the Son silenced him. God the Son prevented him. God the Son stopped him. In one of his books, Watchman Nee has a study on the three times that the Lord stopped and silenced Peter. In the opening verses here in Matthew chapter 17, God the Father silenced Peter. Remember, we said earlier they were up on top of the mountain and it was such a, it was such a uh, experience. There's Moses, there's Elijah, there is Jesus in all of his glory. This time, old Peter's preaching a sermon and he said, Jesus, I want to build three altars, one to you and one to Moses and one to Elijah. And God the Father, by saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And then in our text, here's Peter. He goes inside the house where Jesus is and he wants to tell Jesus all that should be done in order to pay the taxes. And here God the son silences Peter. And then in Acts chapter 10, verse 44, Peter is preaching to the household of Cornelius and he was just getting started. And God the Holy Spirit silences Peter. And it says in Acts 10, 44, while he was yet speaking, the Holy Spirit came down on them that heard the word. You know what? It's a good time sometimes to be silenced. It's a good thing to be still and know that he is God. You know what? Jesus already knew the need. Peter didn't know the need. Peter thought he needed money. He didn't need money. What he needed was faith. Money was just a byproduct. Our God owns the cattle on a thousand hills and the wealth in every mine. Peter didn't need money. He needed faith. You say, well, I need good health. No, you need faith. Someone says, well, I need a job. No, you need faith. Abraham thought he needed another wife. He didn't need another wife. He needed patience. Moses thought he needed an army. If only we had enough people, 
with enough swords, we could take care of Egypt. No. You don't need an army. You need a lamb. And when you get the lamb and put the blood on the doorpost, that'll take care of Egypt. You see, you and I don't really know our needs. Because the heart is deceitfully wicked above all things and desperately wicked. And who can know it? But I'm going to tell you this. And listen to me. Jesus Christ knows your need. You know why he knows your need? He knows your need because he's God. If any miracle shows us the deity of Jesus Christ, it is this one. And as Peter comes through the door, Jesus silences him. He already knew the need. I'm glad that God knows my need. I don't really know my need. He looks into my mind and he looks into my heart and he studies my life. And he says to me, this is what you need. Here I am running here and running over there and trying to get a hold of this trinket and trying to scheme about this. And all the while, Jesus is saying, that's not what you need. You need what I have for you. He knows what we need because he's God. There's a brilliant scientist who wrote a book called The Origin of the Universe. And I want you to turn to Psalm chapter 147. Psalm chapter 147. And here's what he says in this book. He says, the basic building blocks of the stars. Oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, and car carbon are the same basic elements that God used to make our bodies. And notice what the God of the universe says in Psalm 147, beginning in verse 3. He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. He telleth the number of the stars. He calleth them all by their names. Great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite. You know what he's saying there? <coughs> he's saying that the God of those stars is the very same God that takes care of the broken heart. You ever had a broken heart? The same God, the God of the stars that created the universe is the very same God that healeth the broken heart. The same elements that are up there are the same elements that are down here in our body. And the same God that knows the name of that star knows my name and knows your name. And the same God who counts those stars is counting the hairs on our head. Now, on some, that's probably not very difficult. But on others, that's quite a chore. When you're facing a problem, you got one today? When you're facing a need, here's the first assurance. Christ knows your need because he's God. Here's something else. He knows your need because he's man. Think about that. He's not just God, but he's man also. He didn't become man first. He was God first and became man. If he was man first, he could have never become God. But since he was God first, he became a man. And the word was made flesh. But he was a man. And sometimes in the heat of the battle, and sometimes when the burden of life presses us down, we are prone to say, well, Lord, you've never been through this. Oh, yes, he has. As a parent, don't you sometimes get tired of hearing your kids say, you don't know how I feel. Oh, yes, we do, because we've been there. And when a child comes to Jesus with a prayer, 
Didn't you love this children's thing today again? When a child comes to Jesus with a prayer, Jesus understands because Jesus was once a child. He knows what it's like to be a child. And when a teenager comes to Jesus with a problem, he knows what it was like because he himself was once a youth. And when a working man with calloused hands comes to Jesus with a problem, he knows about it because he was once a carpenter. And when somebody who belongs to a minority race comes to him, he knows about it because he belonged to one. And when somebody who is suffering comes to him, he knows about it because he too suffered as a man. And when somebody who is being slandered and lied about comes to him, he says, I know just how you feel. They spit upon me. And when someone who has been rejected comes to him, Jesus knows about that. In his humility, his justice was taken away. And when somebody who is going through the valley of the shadow of death comes to him, he knows about that as well because he went through it. Jesus Christ knows your need because he's God and because he's man. So you don't have to set out like Peter to explain it to him. Oh, you can share it with him because it says... Casting all your care upon him because he cares for you. Number two, the second great assurance, my second great big point. Jesus Christ not only knows your need, he's concerned about your need. He's concerned about our every need. Isn't it marvelous to think about the fact that the God of the universe who has galaxies after galaxies after galaxies after galaxies after galaxies after galaxies after galaxies to watch over knows the burden and the need of our own heart individually. And he's concerned. You know why he's concerned? He's concerned for three reasons. Number one, he's concerned for your sake. Turn, if you would, to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1. And I want to show you something here about Peter. Now this is Peter who has matured as a believer. This is not the same Peter who ran into the house where Jesus was to explain to him the need for taxes. This was not the same Peter who denied the Lord. This is a Peter who has matured. Why has he matured? Because he's gone through the battles of life and he's trusted Christ every step of the way. And notice what he writes here in verse 6. He says, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold testing. Boy, doesn't that explain your life and mine at different phases in our life? You've been through some struggles. Even you folks in the balcony have been through some struggles. We've all been there. And then notice what he says in verse 7. That the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes. He's concerned for your sake. Why? Number one, so that the trials and the needs of life will purify your faith. I told a man that came down and said, can I pray with you this morning? And we sat here and, and prayed. I said to him, I said, you know, I said, I'm so impressed with the future of First Baptist. God is going to continue to use this church. And there's never been a greater time in all the world when this church is more needed than now. Why does God allow these things to come into our life? 
Why does he allow these things to come into our churches? Why does he allow these things individually to, to come into our lives? Because he wants to purify our faith. He wanted Pe Peter to grow in his faith. Peter, don't trust your fishing boats. Trust me. Early on, Peter had all kinds of schemes. He had plan A and plan B and plan C. But the very reason that God allows and permits the needs and problems to come into our life is that he wants to purify our faith. And notice what he said. It's more valuable than gold. When you trust me, Peter, you're making a great investment. Not only that, but notice, he wants to purify your hope. He says, it's uh, through it, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. He says, listen, I want this trial. I want this need. I want this difficulty in your life to bring praise and honor and glory and to make you long for Jesus to return. And when you and I are facing a need and a problem, oh, how it lifts our spirit to want to see Jesus. Not only that, but look at the first part of verse 8. By, by the way, this is the same guy writing this that we read about in chapter 17 that wanted to build an altar, not just to Jesus, but to Moses and Elijah as well. And here we read, whom having not seen, ye love. He allows those things to come into your life and mine so that he can purify our love. Peter, I don't want you to be concerned about taxes. Peter, what I want you to do is to love me. Peter, if you really loved me, you wouldn't be afraid because perfect love casteth out fear. Jesus is saying, Peter, look, don't worry, I love you. I'll take care of your need. And then lastly, notice it says here in the last part of verse 8, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. He wants to purify your joy. One of the greatest joys in your life takes place when God meets some need. You know what I mean. You've had some need that God has met. And what does it produce? When God meets some need and saw, solves some problem in your life, we rejoice. I remember when we first moved here. I moved to Richmond, Indiana when I was 12 years old. My parents moved here to start Hillcrest Baptist Church. We didn't have any money. And... Uh, I had, I, they enrolled me at Test Junior High School, and I had a need. I had to have five dollars. Now, five dollars in that day, 1964, was a lot worth a lot more than five dollars today. Well, that's a pretty big need. I said to my dad, I said, Dad, I got to have five dollars. Well, I knew he didn't have it. You know why? Because he said, Well, son, you need to pray about that. <laughs> I thought he doesn't have the money. And so I did. I started praying about it. Twelve years old. And I got a letter one day. And the Girdleys will know this person. A guy by the name of Bill Tabor. And I opened that letter. And I kid you not. Out fell a five dollar bill. Had I been charismatic. I would have gone all the way. Man I was excited. And ran to my dad. I said dad. I said look at this. It works. It works. It works. He said, what works? I said, you told me to pray about that need and God just gave it to me. Then I went back and I read the, read the letter and it said, please give this to your dad for the new work that he started in Richmond, Indiana. <laughs> he said, son, you keep it. You prayed it in. And when God meets some need, the reason he gave you that need is he wanted to purify not only your faith, not only your hope, not only your love, but he wanted to purify your joy. Number two, not only is he concerned for your sake, 
But notice this, I think he's concerned for his sake. Now follow this. Don't you agree he has something at stake here? Suppose the money wasn't provided. Suppose Peter had to go back to that tax collector and he had to say, I'm sorry, we don't have the money. Oh, what you're telling me is you can't pay your taxes. That's what you get for trusting him. You say that he will meet your need and you can't pay a half shekel tax? You see, if the Lord doesn't meet your need, he loses something even more important than us. He loses his glory. And I'll tell you this, God has more to lose than you do. If he doesn't take care of you, he loses reputation. He loses testimony. Look at verse number 27, the last verse. See those two words, me and thee? The last two words, in the King James anyway, me and thee. You know what that tells me? Here's what that tells me. That tells me that my needs are linked to his glory. That's why you and I pray in the name of Jesus. When we come to ask our Heavenly Father for something that we need, not our greeds, but when we come to ask our Heavenly Father about something that we need, we ask for this in Jesus' name. What's that mean? Why do we do that? Because we are asking for something that He would ask for. When we pray in Jesus' name, we mean that we are linking our needs to his name. And, besi and by supplying your needs, and by supplying my needs, his name will be glorified. That's why God doesn't answer selfish prayers. Because selfish praying doesn't bring glory to his need. Peter had a need. He had a legitimate need. He had a real need. Look, Peter. Look, listen, Peter, I'm going to meet your need so that I can bring glory to my name. Jesus Christ is concerned about your needs and mine for his sake. He's concerned for his sake, but he's concerned for one other reason. He's concerned for the sake of others. Look at verse number 27. Notwithstanding lest we should offend them. Here's an outsider. Watch this. An unbelieving Pharisee, the tax collector that showed up to collect the money. And Jesus said, we can't afford to cause them to stumble. Isn't it interesting? It is to me that Jesus paid a tax to a temple that he didn't necessarily agree with everything that was going on. If our Lord Jesus would have been like a lot of rebels, he would have, and would have been like some, he would have said, pay a tax to that corrupt place. Pay a tax to Caiaphas, who is corrupt. Pay a tax to those Pharisees who are corrupt. The Lord said, look, Peter, we don't approve of everything that goes on down there. But lest we should cause someone to stumble, we're going to go ahead and pay this. And the Lord Jesus is giving us a beautiful example of how you and I sometimes need to lay aside our privileges for the sake of others. Do you ever hear a Christian say, I don't care what they think. You know, sometimes in courage, we got to say that. Martin Luther said, here I stand. I can do none other. So help me God when it came to the issue of justification by faith. But there are times when you and I had better lay aside the selfish exercises of our own privileges for the sake of others. And that principle will solve a lot of problems. With this principle, lest we cause someone else to stumble, you can rip a lot of the guidebooks and the do's and don'ts. 
When a Christian does this in love, when a Christian says, I will not cause someone else to stumble, that solves a lot of problems. You see, I don't have the right to give up my liberty. That was bought and paid for on the cross of Calvary. But I do have the liberty sometimes to give up my rights. And that's a good thing to do sometimes. Paul said in Romans, it is good neither to eat meat or drink wine, nor to do anything that causes a brother to stumble. Christ is concerned about your need. And lastly, my third assurance that I pull out of this text. Jesus Christ will meet your need. He has the power to do it. I don't have the power to meet all my needs. Peter said, I'm the king. Or Jesus, Jesus said to Peter, Peter, I'm the king. They have no right to tax the king. That's okay, Peter. I'm the king. I will show them what I can do. That's the message of Matthew. This story is not recorded in Mark. It's not recorded in Luke. It's not recorded in John. It's only recorded in Matthew. And the reason it's recorded in Matthew is Matthew presents Jesus Christ as the king of kings. He said, Peter, I'm the king. How do we know he's the king? He commands the fish. Jesus constantly exercised his dominion over nature. Over nature. Remember that in Jerusalem, he kept all the birds quiet except one. And that bird crowed just for Peter. He calmed the waves. He calmed the storms. And here he had someone drop a coin in the water and not jump in after it. That's a miracle in and of itself. And he had a fish come along and get the coin and not strangle. And the coin stayed in that fish's mouth. And he had Peter drop a hook or drop a line in the water. And that exact fish came along at just the right time. And although he had a coin in his mouth, he bit into the hook and he didn't drop the coin. Peter caught the right fish. My liberal friends like to say it was coincidence. That wasn't coincidence. It was a miracle. Peter, I'm the king. I have the power to meet your need. And watch this. Peter didn't sit on the porch and let the fish come to him. When God is going to meet your need and when God is going to solve your problem, he's going to have to work in you and he is going to have to work through you. He will tell you what to do. He will give you the strength to do it. And what you can't do, he'll take over and do the rest. Jesus Christ can meet your need because he has the power to do that. When Jesus Christ makes a promise, Jesus Christ will keep that promise. You believe the promises of God and you act upon them. Peter, go down to the riverbank, take a hook, take a line, cast it in, and the first fish you catch will have a coin in its mouth. Can't you just see Peter doing that? Picks up his fish and pole down to the river bank, takes that hook and he drops it into the water. And you know, I'm not much of a fisherman. I've only been fishing a couple times in my life. But some places I've gone, there's always been a bunch of boys gathered around the old fishing hole and the swimming hole. And, and perhaps there's a bunch of boys hanging around down there and he gets down there at the river bank and he puts some bait on the end of that hook and, and he drops it in the water. And one of those boys said, hey, mister, what are you doing? And old Peter says, I'm fishing. Well, mister, aren't you Simon Peter? And don't you usually use nets? You can't catch, catch many fish with just one hook. 
I don't use my nets anymore. I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. And that boy says, well, Mr. Simon, why are you fishing then? Well, son, you've got to understand I'm paying my taxes. <laughs> that boy scratch. Well, mister, how is fishing going to help you with that? Well, he's going to have some money in his mouth. Just then he feels that tug at the end of his line. Could it be? And those boys perhaps stand there and watch as Peter pulls that line out of the water. And on the end of that line is a fish with a coin in his mouth. And he makes that message so clear and so plain. I don't care what your need is. I don't care how difficult it appears. I don't care about that burden that you are facing. I'm God. I'm the king. I'm going to meet that need. You know, last week I was in Naples, Florida. This is an incredible ministry. They raised eight and a half million dollars for planting churches. I kid you not, eight and a half million dollars. And in 2007, the director and founder of the Timothy Initiative, Dr. David Nelms, was pastoring a mega church in Miami, Florida. And he told me, he said, I stood out in my parking lot one day. He says, looked at my buildings. Every Sunday, 7,000 people gathered together to worship God. And he said, I stood out in my parking lot and I looked and 635,000 cars drive by our church every week. And the Spirit of God spoke to my heart. He said, you're pretty comfortable, buddy. He said, I want to move you out of that comfort zone. Well, I know you got a pool in the backyard. Nothing wrong with that. I know you got that big house. But I'm going to move you out of that comfort zone. And he said, I told me, he said, I had to say yes to the Lord. And he said, a month later, I told my board I needed to resign, that I was going to start what then he was calling Mission India. He started to raise some support, and he went into India, and he found people that shared his vision, pastors who were pastoring churches, little churches, most of them. And he shared his vision about church planning, and he shared with them the concept of what he called Paul, Timothy, and Titus. And he started to train many of them as Paul's in India. It spread to Africa. It spread to Nepal. It spread to 25 different countries. Just planting churches. And he can plant a church for $333. And the reason he does can do it at that cost is he doesn't build buildings, he doesn't pay salaries. He just finds people who want to make disciples, who want to make disciples, who want to make disciples. And he went in and trained Paul's. And then he gave him the material to train a Timothy. And if you're a Timothy, you have to agree to start two new churches. And every church you start has to agree to take care of an orphan and has to agree to take care of a widow. And then those Tituses go out, or those Timothys go out and find Tituses. And they get them to the point through their education, their Christian education, where they become Timothys. And their goal is to plant two new churches. And since 2008, he's planted over 140,000 churches. I went with them. I wanted to see for myself before we put money from Hillcrest into it. So I went with them. I went with them to Ghana and I went with them to Kenya. And in Ghana, uh, we stayed in a tent. And I told you a couple of weeks ago, my idea without camping out is Holiday Inn without maid service. Man, I hated it. And one night I hated it even more because I walked in and there was a big old snake curled up there looking at me. I thought, it's tent isn't big enough for me and that snake. 
And I thought, I'm getting out of here. And I went back up to the base camp. I said, hey, somebody's going to have to go down and get that snake out of there. And so they did. And I thought, I ain't sleeping in that place. I walked around all night. But I saw for myself the work that is being done. I, I was stood out underneath a coconut tree with 250 believers who had all been saved because one lady got saved. Her husband is a general in the Sudanese army. He has four wives. She's one of them. She reached her two boys for Christ. They're now the pastors of that church. And every week there's 250 people. And we went to the refugee camps. Churches all over. It's pretty incredible. He has a burden to start that in the United States. And I, I told you that to tell you this, because I'm going to close with a point here in a minute, which I think is so important. He has a couple of places where they're trying this. It's, it's really more difficult here in the United States. We're spoiled. The poorest of the poor here, 90% of them have more than 90% of the world. And I'm not being critical. I'm talking to myself as well. I don't ever want to get to the point where in my preaching, I point a finger that's not pointed back at me. But a guy, I was introduced to a guy by the name of uh, Malcolm Carver. He took a church in uh, 1999 in Coleman, Alabama. A church that was running uh, 25, 30 people. And now every Sunday he preaches to over 2,500 people. And he shared his story. He said, we built buildings and filled it, built more buildings and filled it, and built more buildings. And he said, when I built my last building, I thought, I don't know if I can do this anymore. He said, I went through a period of great depression. And, and he said, the problem with me was we were reaching a lot of people, but we weren't seeing a lot of people saved. We weren't reaching a lot of people that were coming to Christ whose lives were being changed. And he said, so I, I talked to Dr. Nelms and he encouraged me to set out on this journey and I did. So we started building micro churches. And the idea of a micro church is one of your guys or women that has a real burden to make disciples. They go out and they start a micro church that is is connected to your church, but they hold it wherever they want. And he said, we had one particular church. They call it the Bondo Church because it's in an automotive shop. He says, every, every Tuesday, 20 people meet in that shop. And he said, one guy, someone from our church invited him to our church every week for a year and he wouldn't come he wouldn't give in the very first week somebody invited him to the bondo church he went and that sunday or that tuesday when they meet he trusted christ and this pastor said i just happened to be there the next sunday after he trusted christ and the person that was preaching was preaching from Genesis chapter 1 on how God created the world and he asked for comments after. And this guy that had been invited every week of the world for one year to come to the big church, the first Sunday he was invited came to this church meeting in this bondo place and he was saved. The next Sunday after the message he stood and here's what he said. And here's the point I'm going to make and how it connects with this miracle. He said, I can't believe that all that Jesus or God had to do was speak. And the worlds came into existence. And my pastor friend that I just met stood there and he said, wow. That's what's wrong in my heart. I've been so consumed with all of these things. 
I've lost the wonder of what God can really do. Peter, I can meet your need. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to take that line. I want you to go down to that riverbank. I want you to stick that hook in the water. And your need is going to be met. I don't know what your need is today. You do. Boy, I can give you these three assurances. Jesus Christ knows your need. He's concerned about your need. And he will meet your need. Would you stand with me, please? With heads bowed and eyes closed, as we take a moment just to reflect in our own heart, in our own seat, what a unique miracle of provision. They had a need. And what a tremendous reminder that Jesus Christ knows our need, is concerned about our need, and he will ultimately meet our need. As you reflect as to where you are, you know, as a church, we got to say, you know, we have a need. We're going to pray and we're going to be patient and we're going to find God's right person. God will supply our need. He knows about it. He's concerned about it. He's concerned for our sake. He's concerned for his sake. He's concerned for the sake of others. But individually, right where you are today, if there's a need in your life and the Holy Spirit of God has spoken to your heart today, would you just lift your hand Nobody will embarrass you. Nobody will point you out. I just want to be able to collectively pray. Who will say, boy, I have a need, preacher. Help me to live in faith that I'll trust God to help me meet that need. Would you just look your hand up in the air? Yes, God bless you all throughout here today. Lord Jesus, you see these needs. And Lord, I pray that folks who have been moved perhaps will find a, a board member, a church member, a friend that can, day, that can today pray with them. I pray, Heavenly Father, that as a church, collectively, we'll be praying for God's leadership and direction and apply this same principle Boy, Jesus knows our need. He's concerned about our need. And he's going to meet that need. And help us today, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together.